What's up? This is Dr. Taylor Crick, host of the Autoimmune Doc Podcast. And today I've got a really interesting case study to present of some just really, really fascinating findings, you know, using functional lab testing, specifically from Great Plains labs. Both of these labs happen to be from, from Great Plains, but a pretty interesting finding. So let's kind of jump into it. So first off, a background on this person or this client or patient. Uh, she has a long neurological history and she's had multiple lesions on the MRIs, but they've said it's not MS, but there's multiple lesions on MRIs and all the symptoms that go along with this. It says uh, 12 years ago, I was diagnosed with the EBV. I've since been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, unknown origin of brain lesions, chronic fatigue, Lyme, CMV, heavy metals, and now recent testing indicated mold. So a lot going on, you know, symptom-wise from a chronic fatigue standpoint, but also just from a neuro standpoint with lesions, lesions on MRI, but not MS. Uh, she said that they've been told it's like pre-MS, but the lesions kind of move in different things. So interesting. She's been treated by multiple Lyme literate doctors, people that I really respect that, you know, have, have helped her in various capacities, um, and chiropractors that I also respect and, and know. Um, and, and so I think they're, they've, different targets have already been kind of checked off the, the checklist. She grew up or slash lives on a farm, which to me, maybe you can guess what that's kind of screaming to me is toxins and pesticides. And that's kind of the reason why we did the labs that, that I did was I, that's exactly what I wanted to to look at, and that's what I was concerned about. She came to me um, after seeing a doctor, and she had had her Cyrex Array 12, which is a pathogen panel that I run pretty often, showed mold reactivity and no Lyme, but very high values for HHV6, which is another neuro virus that can, can cause neurodegeneration, so I think that that's still on our radar as well, uh, but mold. And the mold is why she was referred to me by you know, multiple practitioners for help with the mold. And I'll tell you too, you know, we're gonna get to this, but they, they had found mold. They had our, the mold testing guy that I use here locally there, I forget what they live, like an hour away maybe. Um, but he tested their house and they've, they've kind of jumped right on mold, which I is to me is a sign of like, that's a good sign. If somebody jumps right on getting their environment clean, they borrowed my fogger, air scrubber, ozone, or they had professional uh, testing, remediation, things like that done. Um, and then the Cyrex 11, that was all that was on the 12, was mold, I think it was stachybotrys, and, and HHV6, um, and, then, and no Lyme. Then the Cyrex 11 showed a total loss of chemical tolerance. So it's like, uh-oh, toxins, toxins, toxins. You've lost chemical tolerance, which I'm thinking, you know, toxic exposure. I'm thinking glutathione depletion. Um, but yeah, I did not check for demyelinating antibodies. I just kind of assumed that they're there. So, you know, that might be a, a logical next step. So I just want to point that out. But I could kind of, you know, there's lesions in her brain. Uh, and so you can kind of presume she, that they're there. She's 30 also. Um, and I was most curious about the mold and the toxins driving the process. So does she have mycotoxins? Does she have fungal colonization? You know, what's going on with the mold? We kind of knew that as a big puzzle piece. So, and that's kind of what we were starting off with also, which it's also, it's always easy to see somebody when they've seen two other practitioners because it's like, okay, the mold is our big target and, and that was all we knew at the time. So here's what her lab showed. Let's look at her lab. So first here's her organic acids test. So this is not a mycotoxin test. This is, uh, but it does show, um, but this shows fungal colonization on the oats test. So this is a candida marker. This is a marker for aspergillus. Um, so we did know that there was fungal colonization, but then the, here we go into kind of the, the, the point of this video. These are neurotransmitter metabolites. So first, this is excessive dopamine or dopamine being converted into homovanilic acid, which that in itself is neurodegenerative. So we're already onto a number of possible mechanisms for neurodegeneration and the need for glutathione and things like that. Um, and the HVA to DOPAC ratio. Um, but then down here, this is the highlight of this video today. This is called kinolinic acid. Kinolinic acid is a tryptophan metabolite. And tryptophan, which is the building block uh, or, or, of 
Well, uh, it is the building block of serotonin and melatonin. But tryptophan is also, I was going to say, what people say like on Thanksgiving will make us tired from turkey. Because tryptophan can go one direction down a pathway that leads to 5-HTP, which is 5-hydroxytryptophan, and then serotonin, and then melatonin so you get good sleep. Or it can go down a, an alternative pathway called the kynurenine pathway. And when it goes down the kynurenine pathway, the majority of tryptophan goes down that pathway anyway. But it can go to some toxic inflammatory metabolites, kinolinic acid being one of them. So kinolinic acid is associated with neurodegeneration. And I'm going to show you some studies on that. So here's a picture, first off, of some of the things. So you start here with tryptophan. And tryptophan can go down the serotonin melatonin pathway. And if there's dysfunctions in that, you're going to get mood or depression. And, and this person doesn't have depression. She's actually very, very happy. Um, but then it goes, if it goes this other way, down the kynurenine pathway, you can get energy depletion. Chronic fatigue syndrome would be the diagnosis for that if it gets to that point. Or you can get excitotoxicity induced neurodegeneration, which is going to show up as lesions on an MRI. So the, here are some studies, too, explaining how this connects to lesions and like MS and, and you know, MRI lesions. So kynurenine pathway, uh, scientific reports, the a Nature, you know, sub-publication. Uh, kynurenine pathway me metabolomics, so that's what those labs are, is metabolomics. Prediction provides mechanistic insight into MS progression. Current evidence for the role of the kynurenine pathway of tryptophan metabolism in MS, frontiers in immunology. And then kynurenines and MS, the dialogue between the immune system and the central nervous system. There's a ton of literature about the kynurenine pathway and its association with MS. Um, it's, 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 it's something that I've studied extensively for, for a long time because one of my friends was diagnosed with MS. And, you know, that was one of the ways that I, you know, even got into functional medicine was by this kynurenine pathway. So this is what the Great Plains Interpretive Guide says. So already, I think we found some pretty cool things that may, may be relevant, but there's one more big finding that we're going to show you. So high kinolinic acid may be a sign of inflammation and neural excitotoxicity. So neuroinflammation is neuroinflammatory. It's derived from tryptophan. It's neurotoxic as an excitotoxin stimulant. It, they have NMDA, um, NMDA type receptors. So that means that those neurons get so excited that they like, you know, kind of pop. And Russell Blaylock is kind of the, the pioneer researcher behind this kind of neurodegenerative uh, discovery. But it's things like aspartame, red 40, you know, food dyes are, are also neuroexcitatory. Um, brain toxicity has been implicated in Alzheimer's, autism, Huntington's, stroke, dementia, HIV, dementia, and schizophrenia. High levels may inhibit car, car contractions, cause lipid peroxidation in the brain, uh, which creates aldehydes, it's malondialdehyde, um, and increased apoptosis of astrocytes, which guard the blood-brain barrier. Um, da, 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 the level of kinolytic acid is also highly correlated with the degree of arthritis impairment. Now, kinolytic acid is also a metal chelator. She's also had heavy metal stuff. Um, overproduction of cytokines like interferon, underproduction. Um, so... Uh, Overproduction, yeah, anyway, let me go on to the next slide. Let's zoom in right here. So it says right here that phthalates, phthalates inhibit the conversion of kinolinic acid to NAD. NAD being a very important step in mitochondrial energy production. NAD also being like the hottest topic in the anti-aging world right now um, for its mitochondrial benefits. But phthalates inhibit the conversion of kinolinic acid to NAD. So treatments can be achieved by multiple approaches. Reduce tryptophan, prevent repeated infections, and subsequent immune overstimulation with su supplementation with clostrum or uh, bovine immunoglobulins. Um, transfer factors and probiotics, so those are immune boosters. Um, look at the gut health blah, 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 reduce the number of vaccines given at one time. And then B6 and magnesium can also halt this as well. So I think that that's pretty interesting. But the phthalates inhibiting the conversion of kinolinic acid, that's pretty interesting, right? Here's her level of phthalates. 
This is from NHANES data, so it's based on kind of the average national person, like thousands and thousands of people in the NHANES you know, cohort, so they know kind of the levels of what people have. This is the 95th percentile. If you're above 374, you're above the 95th percentile for this monoethyl phthalate. Her number is 2,677. So phthalates inhibit the conversion of kinolinic acid Kinolinic acid is elevated. Kinolinic acid is part of this kynurenine pathway, and it predicts and provides mechanistic insight into why her lesions are progressing or changing or why she has chronic fatigue as well because NAD is being inhibited, and that's impacting her mitochondria. So, fascinating. This says phthalates may be the most widespread group of toxins in our environment. They're in many beauty and bath products. They're in a lot of cosmetics. They're most famous for their reproductive effects. So, as it says down here, they're the feminization of males and the hyper-masculinization of, of the developing male brain. And also just uh, altering their endocrine disruptors. So altering, you know, estrogen balance and association. Phthalates are associated with breast cancer and some other things. Uh, and it says here, let's double check that breast cancer. Um, phthalates have been implicated, I may be thinking of parabens. I think I'm thinking of parabens. But phthalates have been implicated in reproductive damage, depressed leukocyte function. Leukocytes are white blood cells. That's immune function. And cancer. Phthalates have been also been found to impede blood coagulation, uh, lower testosterone, and alter sexual development in children. So fascinating. And now we have not solved this puzzle yet, but these are massive pieces. So, so now what? We still have all these things to check off the checklist. You know, add HHV6 onto this list, add mycotoxins onto this list. But we have to now we have to avoid phthalates. So that was the first step is like, okay, let's get educated on where phthalates could come from and let's start making some changes pretty quickly. We have to avoid mold in the environment. That's something that I already mentioned that they took quick action steps on, but that's always going to be on the radar. We need to kill mold. We need to eradicate fungal colonization. Whoops. We need to block the kinurinine pathway with different supplements, you know, magnesium, B6, you can use 5-HTP, you can use NAD for energy. You need to decrease neuroinflammation and mast cell activation, that's one of the mechanisms that's, that's underlying the neuroinflammation. And you need to eradicate fungal colonization. Now, even with this one, there's a million pieces to that. You know, vitamin D is a, a one, one small piece. You know, um, oxygenation to the brain, methylation, you know, glutathione and oxidative stress. So all these things are going to be a piece of our, 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 our you know, puzzle. But right now what we're doing is environment and eradicating fungal colonization and focusing on gut health and beginning to start focusing on detox, 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 opening those detox pathways, restoring glutathione levels, um, et cetera. So that's really, I think, a really interesting case and a really interesting case, too, of how we can use labs and use, you know, labs that other people have run, too, so not, not you know, running every panel under the sun, but using somebody's history and their extensive history to think, okay, what could be going on? And then labs to kind of pinpoint, okay, ding, ding, ding. Now we need to check off some of these boxes and kind of follow up and see where we're at, you know, along the way. But then also down the road, follow up where we'll see where we're at lesion-wise with neurologists of how is our brain looking uh, under the hood. So, thanks.